Okay, we are live in five, four, three. Hello, and welcome to Baking with Chickens, the show where I bake using eggs from my backyard chickens. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm your host here at Baking with Chickens. Mr. Baking with Chickens is here behind the scenes running our live show today, and I am going to show you how to make Swiss meringue style macarons that don't require drying time and you don't have to do that arm aching macronage. Too good to be true? Maybe, possibly, but we're gonna try the Swiss meringue style macaron and let's see if it works. So, let's get started. All right, so the first thing here with our ingredients, let me put aside my eggs, is I need a stove. So for Swiss meringue, and if you joined me last week when I made the meringue pie, hold oh please, if you joined me last week when I made meringue pie, you will remember that I made Swiss meringue. Now Swiss meringue, ooh, what's going on here? Maybe too hot. Swiss meringue is made by using egg whites and granulated sugar and melting them together over a double boiler. So there are three main types of meringue that people typically use. A Swiss meringue, a French meringue, and Italian meringue. Now, let me turn it down. Italian meringue is the most common and most commonly used for macarons because, I'll tell you in a little bit, but that's the type where you melt the sugar into a syrup to a certain temperature and then you pour it while the egg whites are whipping into a meringue. French meringue is the type that you sprinkle in the sugar while you're whipping up the meringues. For Swiss, you are going to melt the sugar into the egg whites before whipping. So an Italian meringue and a Swiss meringue provide a more stable whipping base for the for the meringue to whip up. So um, if you've seen my All About Meringue episodes, you've seen me make any kind of meringue, I always say you want a nice stable meringue. Um, French is the least stable because you need that sugar to melt and sometimes when you eat it, it can be grainy. That's why that happens. So my favorite is a Swiss meringue. So making these macarons today, I'm gonna do a Swiss macaron and we're gonna see if this theory works out. So. Um, if you are making this recipe at home, the link to the recipe is down in the description below. Feel free to grab it. You can follow along or you can make it later. And then while you're down there, please hit like, subscribe, share, all that good jazz. Um, don't forget there is a live comment feed so you can ask me questions and comment anytime that you'd like. And if you're just joining us now, I'm making black or blah. If you're just joining me now, I'm making Swiss meringue style macarons. Um, are we ready? Here we go. Mr. Bacon Chickens, everything all right over there? I think everything's good. We've got <laughs> nobody commenting on technical difficulties. Okay. But we do have Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hello, friends. Bok Bok Bouquet. Hello. Emily. Hi, Emily. Oh, Emily. Corbin. Emily suggested that we make macarons, so this is all thanks to her. Ah, that's right. Oh, hey. And we've got Corbin and Dan. Sweet. Hi, guys. Oh, hey, you forgot to play the thingy about macarons. So these are French macarons, not macaroons. And if you don't know the difference, a macaron is a meringue type baked cookie with olive flour. A macaroon is made with little tidbit of information. So it's actually really common that it's mispronounced. A lot of people say macaroon instead of macaron, and a macaroon is the coconut. So, all right, so the recipe is pretty basic. I really love this recipe because it's easy to remember. It's 100 grams of egg whites, which is approximately from three eggs, 100 grams of granulated sugar. You pour them together and then you melt them over this double boiler. And the other ingredients I have over here, I have 100 grams of powdered sugar, 100 grams of almond flour, and then I'm flavoring it with a little bit of cocoa powder and a pinch of salt. Okay, so 
So I don't want to cook these too much. I only want it enough so that the sugar has totally melted. Uh, let's see, let me test it. There we go. Okay, so as long as I don't feel any gran granules, we're all good. I'm gonna turn that off, set it aside. Ah. Oh no, that dropped. Hey, we have a new toy to play with. Check out this clear glass KitchenAid bowl. Oops, excuse me, Miles is dinging. He's just gonna have to wait. Oh no, okay, so, hey, there's a lot going on right now. Ah. All right, so I kind of made a boo-boo while I was talking, and if you can see in here, can you see it? Top down, give me a top down camera. Okay, so I fucked up a little bit. So if you can see, see these little bits right here? So it was too hot, I cooked it for too long and I was distracted talking, so I scrambled my egg whites. See these little globby bit, like they look like little snot? We don't want that. You don't want the cooked egg whites. So I effed up and I'm gonna have to strain this which is okay. Whoops. All right, so I'm gonna strain it so that we don't have the egg whites, and that sucks, but that's great because now you can see what not to do. So you want to not cook until you get scrambled eggs. There we go, haha. -ha. I wasn't sure if that was gonna work. I was just making this up on the fly. So if you do get the scrambled eggs, look, I just got a mesh strainer and I'm just pouring the egg whites through so that it will catch the scrambled bits and not the part that I actually need. Oops. Stuff happens, we're just gonna keep going with it. Bok, bok, bake. That's what that means, by the way. It's just like, oh, whoops, I fucked up. I made a mistake. Buck, buck, bake. We're just gonna keep on going and adjusting because that's what we do in life. Oh, Miles, this dog. Okay. So I'm probably gonna have a little bit less than 100 grams since I scrambled it, but that's gonna be okay. Um, if you look at some macaron recipes, they're always like a little bit different, but I like this 100, 100, 100 because it's easy to remember. It works out really great. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, like check out this like egg white looks like snot. <laughs> okay, boop. Let's move on. How's everybody doing today? You having a good Sunday? How'd you feel with um, daylight savings? It's kind of yucky, huh? I was not a fan. Oh, we've got Travis. Hi, Travis. Amanda. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Well, says, Ruh -roh, <laughs> cook them. <laughs> Whoops. All right, so now I'm gonna whip oh. them. One quick question. Yes. From Dan. Is there anything you can make with the sweetened semi-cooked egg whites? Mm, I mean, you could find something to cook them with, I'm sure. But, eh. I mean, like, I could just whip them into this, but then it just won't be nice and smooth for the macarons. Let me think about it. Yeah. Let's think about it while we whip these into meringue. And we have a nerdy food fact while I whip these into Stiff Peaks because I don't think you want to watch this whip into Stiff Peaks for like two to three minutes. So here we go. Nerdy food fact. who was an Italian noblewoman who married a French king, King Henry, was the one who brought it to France. Her Italian pastry chef brought these cookies to France and that's when it became so popularized that they became known as Parisian macarons or French macarons. Okay, you wanna go off, off you go. <laughs> and that's how they became known as 
French macarons. They took it by storm, and typically these cookies actually didn't have the fillings yet. It was just like the egg white and almond flour cookies, and it wasn't until the 1930s that a brand called La Durée created the little sandwich cookies that we love so much today. And La Durée, if you don't know, is the ultimate, most delicious, best macarons that I've ever had in Paris. So check them out if you're ever there. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, so that's why when you typically see recipes to make French macarons, they're made using a French style meringue or an Italian style meringue because they were popularized by the French, but they were invented by the Italians. Now I'm doing a Swiss meringue style macaron and in Switzerland, macarons are called Luxembourgerly. Luxembourgerly? Luxembourgerlies. <laughs> so it's essentially the same cookie, it's the same ingredients, but the way that the cookie is made is that they're slightly domed. So French macarons have a flat top and they have a little rise in the feet and Luxembourgerly are a little bit more domed. So they look like little hamburgers and they're lighter and airier, but they're essentially the same cookie. So whether it's a macaron, a Luxembourgerly, they're delicious and we love them. So that is the history of macarons. Let's go back and check on the meringue whipping that I'm doing here in the kitchen. I don't know. All right, if you can hear me, I'm still whipping. We're whipping. Almost there. Okay, can we get the top down? Okay, okay so I wanna stop for a sec to show you something. All right, so see how I am whipping these and it is a little runny still. So like it's whipping, but it's kind of like it's runny. So this isn't right. So if you're still, if you're trying to whip your meringues and they're not whipping up and it's like this, you gotta keep on going. And like moisture, humidity, and temperature definitely matter as well. Whip it into stiff peaks, if you can hear me. Yeah. <clears throat> if you can hear me, I'm trying to whip them into stiff peaks, not soft peaks. So you know when you get soft peaks, if you pull the whisk out and then they kind of start flopping over, that's soft peaks. We need stiff peaks. So when you pull them out, they're standing up straight. show you up oh, it's still kind of gooey we're gonna keep on going this is taking longer than usual Well, I wanted to stop and show you what soft peaks look like. So this is soft peaks. So see how it's kind of limp and falling over? Mm-hmm, exactly, yup. You got a dirty mind of a 12 year old, you know what I'm talking about. So this is a soft peak. We need to keep whipping until it stands up straight. Yes, and what's the question? And maybe I can run away somewhere quiet and answer the question. <laughs> well, we've got a couple, so you get that started and then we'll 
you know. Okay. Oh, camera. So, Heidi is here. Oh, she says, I've been to that bakery yeah. in Paris. Lines around the corner just to get in. It's so good. It really is one of the best. Um, yeah, we're doing our best, Dan, with the fun <laughs> multi-film screen views. We're ironing it out. Thank you, Michelle. And yes, Chelsea, thank you for learning something new. Oh, here's a great question. Does KitchenAid make a glass bowl for all mixer models? I believe they do. So if you go onto KitchenAid.com and their website, you can see all the different bowls. They have ceramic ones, they have pretty designs. So they have some really cool stuff. And like the colors of their machines are really good too. I will okay. say that the glass bowl and the specialty bowls are not for the faint of heart. Okay. All right. So now we've got stiff peaks. So I see all your questions. I'm going to answer those in one sec, but I want to finish showing you what stiff peaks look like. Okay. So this is stiff peaks. See, like you pull it out and it's not, it's standing straight up. So. I could probably keep whipping it a little bit more. I'm gonna give it like one more minute um, while I answer your quick question here. So other mac my favorite macaron places. So if you haven't been to Paris um, and you haven't tried La Durée, they are fantastic. Pierre Hermes is also another really good Parisian brand. Um, if you're here stateside, um, Lady Yum in Seattle is one of my favorites. They are so good. She does do mail order, um, so you can get them shipped. And then here in Los Angeles, oh shoot, what's the place I like? Let's. Let's. It used to be called Paulette's and then it turned into Let's, um, but they're my other favorite here in LA. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna whip this just a tiny bit more because we are making macarons and these are the most finicky cookie of all time. So I'll talk about that in a second. I think this is looking really good. So if you're making macarons, um, really having a stand mixer is the way to go. If you're trying to do this with like a hand beater, it's gonna be really hard. I mean, you could do it. It's just a lot of extra work. Hey, look, perfect. Look at that. Perfectly standing straight up and tall. Ooh, hey, check this out. Okay, so remember how one of my most annoying things is scraping the beaters? <gasps> Check it out. My mother-in-law, the very wonderful Sandy Hughes, sent me this Pampered Chef whisk scraper. And this is gonna be my first time trying it. So let's see how it works. Ta-da. Hmm. <laughs> okay, that's kind of cool. So this little tool from Pampered Chef has like a tiny keyhole. You can see it. Can we see this keyhole here? Yeah, see how it has a, a little keyhole? that you use to stick between the tines and pull it out. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, now I can't see it because, <laughs> so okay. Um, if you know me, I'm very anti-kitchen gadget tool. I find that there's really just too many things and most of the time we don't really need all of these things. Um, 
and to clutter our lives and clutter our kitchen. Mr. Baking with Chickens, however, loves the gadgets and I have to argue with him every time when he wants to buy something. So, okay, so here's my verdict on this whisk tool. Like, okay, yes, it's really cool. It's kind of neat that it has this hole to scrape, but it's not really, like it's kind of making more a mess and it's taking me a lot longer than just using my fingers. Uh, because meringue is sticky. sticky. If that was well. frosting, it might be easy. Nah, well, we're gonna have, well, I don't know. We should That being see. said, I love it. Sourdough <laughs> starter. Yeah, we do use it for other things, um, but not for this. Like, I think for this, yeah, because it's very sticky. Like, I would just rather use my fingers. Um, however, if you are the type of person who doesn't like sticky things on your fingers, or if you're the type of person who doesn't want people shoving their fingers in the food they make for you, <laughs> um, then I think that would be better. Aha, look at, look at that. All right, perfect. Sticky fingers. Very cool. All right, let me uh, Chelsea has a question. Yeah. What's your favorite flavor of macaron? <gasps> Earl Grey. Oh yeah, no, I'll take it back. Lady Yum in San Francisco, only during the summer months, has a seasonal special flavor called the Bomb Pop. So if you've ever had like a Bomb Pop popsicle that's blue, white, and red, red, white, and blue, yeah. Um, and it's cherry, lime, and raspberry flavored, Lady Yum in San Francisco makes a macaron that tastes exactly like a bomb pop. And it is my favorite one of all time, and I love it. Um, other than that, so that's my number one favorite, hard to find and hard to recreate, but my second favorite is Earl Grey. Okay, so the next step here is, I've preheated my oven to 300 degrees. I think it's 300, right, Mr. Bacon and Chickens? Oh. What do I preheat to? Mm, let me double check. Hey, let me look at my outline. Oh, I got it. 300. Okay, good. Making sure. I didn't want to mess that one up. Okay. So I'm going to take all my dry ingredients and sift them together into a bowl. You want to sift them so that they're nice and incorporated and powdery because you don't want clumps in the macarons. So I have my 100 grams of powdered sugar here. I'm going to sift this in. And if you have a sifter, like the one where you like squeeze with your hands, that's good too. Um, but like I said, I don't like kitchen gadgets if I don't need them because this mesh strainer works just as good and it's one less thing that I have to find a place to store. Um, and the reason is, you know, I lived in apartments in LA for a long time. Our house is really small and there's just really no place to store all of these things. Um, you know, all the toys are fun, but you can still make great things without all of the tools and toys. That's my theory anyway. Except for the most magical gadget, the zoodler. The zo <laughs> so, does anyone have a zoodler, like where they cut the zucchini into spirals? So Mr. Baking with Ch Chickens insisted, insisted, through a child tantrum, insisted that we had to get a zoodler when we were growing these monster squash. And then he ended up buying one. And then how many times have you used it? Maybe twice? You've used it none. I've maybe used it twice. No, no, that's not true. Hmm. I've used it at least once. <laughs> so I would say the zoodler is one of my most useless tools. And I know that there's a lot of uses for it. If you want to eat healthy, that's cool, but like it's just not something we use. What gadgets do you like? Are there stuff that like you, oh, you know what gadget I do really like is um, the egg slicer thing. That is one that has come in really handy. You know the one where like you put hard boiled eggs in and they slice it? Ah, we've got a question to catch up on here. Yeah. Michelle asks, do flavorings for the cookies, part of the macaron, need to be dry things, nothing wet? Yes, dry things are better. So dry flavors, um, powders are better. 
You could do a little bit of like extract, like a little vanilla extract is okay because you've got your egg whites here. So if you're doing a liquid flavor, you don't want to do too much, just a tiny bit, and then you would whip it in with the egg whites. Um, if you're doing a dry flavor, so like I'm using cocoa powder, I have a little half teaspoon of cocoa powder here. Um, you would do that. Freeze dried fruits are really good if you take the freeze dried fruits and you pulverize them and turn them into a little powder and then mix it in with the dry ingredients. That's another really good way. Macarons are little finicky cookies. Like if you've ever enjoyed, if you ever tried making them, like they're so hard to make. Like the tiniest little variation and they don't work. Like if it's too hot, it doesn't like it and they won't bake up properly. If it's too humid, the skins won't set up properly and they won't make the little feet and then they'll crack. So I checked the humidity and it is 57, yeah, it's 57% humidity in Los Angeles today. And I'm like, mm, it makes me feel a little bit iffy, but I think it could be okay. We're gonna try. Ah, uh, Eva's. Oh, so Eva is my cousin who is also a baker extraordinaire and she is a pro at making macarons. I am but an imposter. She is very good at them. And she said get a dehumidifier. Also, uh... oh, Eva said that is awesome. I need one. Was that maybe regarding the zoodler, the whisk, or the dehumidifier? <laughs> Glass balls. Oh, whisk scalper. Oh. Question mark from Emily. Whisk scalper? This thing? Is that what that's or, or no, oh, that's the thing where you like stick it on top and then you like pull it down. Yeah, but then I gotta chase the silicone thing around miles. Oh, Cat Apocalypse <sighs> says, yeah, we got a spiralizer. Yeah, didn't we all? We all went through that phase. And then now it's like the air fryer. Okay, I'm adding a little pinch of salt into this. Um, my salt looks funny because I have some rosemary salt that I was playing with, so that's what that is. All right, so you're gonna whisk it all together. You could probably even sift it a couple times, but I lazy, so we're just gonna go with it. All right, so the next step here is to add your dry ingredients into the Swiss meringue. So other ways of making meringue. I've made it using the French macaron style where I sprinkle the sugar in and like meh. Most people love the Italian meringue where you pour in that sugar syrup and every time I've made it, it's been a mess, but it creates a really good stabilized meringue. So the Swiss meringue one was kind of new to me, but it makes perfect sense. So we're gonna try it. So I'm gonna add all my dry ingredients in here. Now typically what I would do for the next step is we need to do something called macronage. Macronage, 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 macronage. I don't know. We're gonna call it macronage. Um, so normally what I would do if I was making macarons is I would take my spatula and fold the dry ingredients into the meringue and you keep folding it until you get the batter into like a slow flowing lava state. And this takes a really long time and it hurts my arms and I don't really like it all that much. However, with the Swiss meringue method, you do the entire macronage step using the sand mixer. I know, scary because you can over macronage. So it's a very tricky step because you need to get it it needs to be thick enough so that you can pipe it and it holds its shape, but thin enough that it makes the shape that you want. And if you overfold it or oh, too much macronage, it gets too runny and I don't know if there's any going back. Maybe Eva knows the answer if there's going back if you've messed up your macronage. But I, I made mine too runny the first time and it was a huge, huge problem. Okay, so the instruction for doing the macronage in the stand mixer is you mix it on low for 10 second intervals and then we're gonna check the consistency to see if it's right and we're gonna keep doing it in five to 10 second intervals until it's right. What's happening here? <laughs> now your butt is in the... Mm -mm. <laughs> What's up? Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> All right. All 
right, I don't know if this is gonna work. I'm a little nervous. Oh, it's working, okay. Look at that. Chelsea says she actually loves her good one. Uses it at least once a week. Now that's a useful gadget if you use it. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm so glad that you use it. Oh, so can we use peanut butter powder then? Absolutely, yes. Peanut butter powder would be really good to make peanut butter macarons, yes. Okay, so see like it's kind of mixed, it's not that good, but I wanted to push the meringue down and out of the way. Okay, let's find out. Dan says, mm, now I'm thinking Reese's macaron. A Reese's? Like peanut butter and like mm -hmm. chocolate? That sounds good, absolutely. Or does he mean Reese's monkey? Reese's. That's just sick. That, don't be weird. That is not encouraged here. Oh, Michelle, try to repost that message. Looks like we had a software come in and knock out your link, but repost, because I just disabled that. I don't know what you're talking about. She, she posted a comment. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So this is where I get nervous because I don't want to overdo it. Okay, so I'm gonna take it out so you can see. Can you see? All right, so what you're supposed to be able to do is take it out and this is supposed to flow like lava off of my thing. Maybe use, yeah, use that side one. So it's supposed to flow like lava off of my whisk and I should be able to draw like a figure eight consecutively. This isn't quite ready yet, but I, this makes me nervous because I don't want to overdo it in the stand mixer because like you, you can do, like that's definitely could happen and then there's no going back. So when I've done this in the past, um, I was nervous and I will stop and then I will finish the macronage by hand. So I'm gonna do that right now so that you could see what you're supposed to do instead of doing it in the stand mixer. And like, I prefer this because it's much easier. It only requires a little bit of arm muscle instead of a lot of arm muscle. Okay, so. So it's basically just this folding motion. Ah, uh, Eva said, and quite a while ago, she commented, you're screwed if you overwear. There you go. Oh, look at that, it's getting there. Oh, you know what, I forgot to add the color. Ha ha. Okay, so macarons are also known for like their big, beautiful, bright candy colors, right? And so I know the ones in the picture are black because the last time I made them, I did a black velvet macaron. And this time I thought since we're kind of close to Easter, it'd be fun to do some teal ones. So I'm gonna do some teal gel food coloring. You don't want to do a liquid food coloring because liquid will add too much moisture into the batter. So a gel food coloring is the way to go. And you only need like a tiny, tiny bit. So I like using either toothpicks or chopsticks to add my color. That's my favorite here. Okay, let's see how that goes. I probably should have added the color sooner so the stand mixture could do the work for me because now I'm not gonna have an even blue. Oh, Michelle asks, you mentioned Earl Grey macaron. Yes. Is that with powdered tea? So an Earl Grey, I would pulverize the tea leaves into a powder and add them into the dry mix. Do a little more blue. Oh man. Put 
there. Don't mess it up. Eee. So macarons are so, okay. They're really intimidating. I was scared to make them for a very long time. I'm still honestly scared to make them and I'm scared if these are even gonna turn out today. But that's kind of the fun of it. And the more you make something, the better you get at it and then the less intimidating it becomes. Okay, no over macronaging yet. So this is why the Swiss meringue method by doing the macronage in the stand mixer is attractive because you see like I got it pretty close and I'm doing it by hand and it's still taking a long time. Like it's flowing, but not quite. And because I'm adding in this pretty late, I'm getting a weird color situation. I'm kind of going for like a robin's egg blue, like not a bright blue. Maybe I should do a bright blue. Let me think. Choo, choo, choo. Yeah, it kind of looks ugly. Let's go for more. Hmm. More, I say, more. That might have been too much. Let's see. There we go. Now we've got some blue. Okay. So you see why this takes a very long time. And why these tiny little cookies cost so much and why they're so expensive. It's because they're so hard to make. Ugh. Hiya. Hiya. Oh my goodness. Oh, I forgot to mention when I was doing the egg white part. So if you are making these and you're using your egg whites, um, a lot of people say that it's best to age your egg whites before you make your macarons. Um, and aging means you basically crack them into a bowl and then you set them out, you put them in the fridge for them to dry out a little bit. So you want some of the moisture content to dry out so that the egg whites, when you whip them, will have more elasticity. Michelle just said, it's baby Yoda macaron. It kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> If only I was good enough to pipe out those little characters, but I am not. I am just nervous. I, I can barely make regular macarons, much less like a baby Yoda or a corgi butt. People who know how to do that, I, it's so incredible to me. Okay, see, so look, it's like still not quite going. So you know what? I'm gonna actually put it back into the stand mixer because my arm hurts and I'm tired. So this will give you an idea of like how long and how much it takes to make them. And like, you know what? You should just try it. Even if the good thing about this is even if these fail, like macaron shells are still really, really good. I eat the failed ones crumbled over ice cream. Okay. So keep going. So this is also a thing where experience does matter. So like you just have to do it to know what the texture feels like. And the first time you're making them, like you have no idea what you're doing. Still going. Man. Okay. Did I 
do it. Pretty good. You know what? Hey, look, here's the thing is, if they don't turn out to be perfect macarons, now I've got Luxembourgerlies. Luxembourgerlies. Lux. <laughs> So they're getting there. It's pretty good. Whew. You see why this is nerve wracking, you guys? Wouldn't it be embarrassing if I made these and they did not turn out? Eh. Ah. Is the video still choppy, guys? We may have just had a little brief moment, but I just want to make sure. Oh, Dan says, Almost. I've always been too intimidated to attempt a macaron, but your video may have just squashed that bug. Thank you guys. You could totally do it. I have faith in you. Although Pacific Northwest, Humidity. Yeah, that's true. But that's like that's the other thing. Like I am so impressed with people who make their livelihoods and have a bakery based on macarons. Like these are so hard. So hard. Okay, there we go. Oh, look, we got it. This is pretty good. So see how this is now flowing off of my spatula and I can draw a figure eight sort of. That is getting much closer to what we need. Height, height, oh. oh my goodness, my arm hurts already and I haven't even been doing this whole thing. Okay, there we go. But it's feeling really good, you guys. Like this is hard to do and it takes a long time, but once you get it right, you'll just know. And also getting it to that perfect consistency is how you're gonna get those flat tops on the macarons. Like if I just stopped and it was a little too thick, um, that's how you kind of get those domed tops. Um, if your macarons look too puffy, that could be why. So you could do this entire step in the stand mixer. And I think like the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. So then you're not like me doing this entire macarona chair by hand and breaking, I'm actually breaking a sweat doing this and it's very hot now. Whew. Okay, there we go. Is it getting thicker? Jesus, come on. So what I'm trying to do is like smush some of those air bubbles out of the meringue to get it to be more runny. Okay, there we go, there we go. See, there we go. Now I can draw my figure eight. You can see it. So see how this is running and I can draw a figure eight. So see how I can draw, I can draw a little figure eight without it breaking. That's when you know it's done. This is maybe a little bit under, but I also know that as I put it into the piping bag, I'm going to kind of like, it'll get some of that out too. So a little under macronage is better than over macronage since there's no going back. So yep, see that? I can draw these little ribbons that's what you're looking for. All right. Whew, that was hot. So now we have that. Okay, so your pans. Your pans are really important. Yeah. So when you make a macaron, you can buy these silicone silpat sheets that have these circles already on it to like pipe it on. Or if you're cheap like me and you don't like more things, you can print out a template on the internets and place it underneath your parchment paper or your regular silicone baking mats, which is exactly what I've done today. So macarons, again, like I said, are very, very finicky. And you want them to have dry shells on the bottom. You don't want them to be sticky and your pan does matter and you have to take it into account. So I have two types of pans here. I have a baking sheet kind of pan and I have like these cookie air bake sheets, right? So what I've learned is these cookie air bake sheets 
are great for cookies because they don't burn the bottoms, but for macarons, because they have the air bake, it doesn't transfer the heat as evenly. So I find that the bottom of my macarons are a bit more sticky and they need to bake for longer if you're using these air bake. Um, I am not gonna use this today. I am gonna use my baking sheets. So I have these other flat baking sheets that don't have the air bake and they transfer the heat immediately. I find that these work better for macarons because it transfers the heat and it cooks it nicely. Um, you can use parchment paper or a silicone baking sheet. I'm gonna try both of them. There's kind of pros and cons to both. Like with the paper, it doesn't stick. It's like, right, like you're touching the metal much easier. With the silicone baking mats, it does evenly transfer the heat across. So we're gonna try both because I know that the batter will give me enough and we'll see how they turn out. All right, I'm gonna do this one first. So I have my templates underneath my printed out pieces of paper. And now I just need to put all of that into my piping bag. How are we doing? Any questions while I'm sitting here doing this? You guys are so awesome, by the way. Thank you for being patient and watching all of this. I mean, sometimes baking, you just gotta watch things happen. It takes a while. Oh my God. <laughs> no one's here. Oh my gosh. No one's watching. I'm doing this by myself. That's okay too. Hey, if you're watching this after the fact and not live, we're gonna start editing these down into shorter, like 10 minute-ish, we're gonna try 10 minute-ish pieces. Um, so you can replay and watch this anytime. But I love it when you guys come hang out with me live. It's like I can be social again. Okay, wow, this glass bowl is real heavy. Yeah, okay. There we go, everything in, everything in. Ta ta ta. Okay. Woo! That hurt. All right, so into our piping bag with the round piping end. I clipped it on the end so that it wouldn't run all over the place. And then here we go. Are we ready? Okay. Okay. So this takes a bit of practice as well because you've got macronage and this is slippery, right? Like these are gonna, if you've overdone, if you've overdone your macronage, it's going to run out of your bag really fast and be hard to control. If you've under macronage, which I think I've got some under macronage here, to be quite honest with you, um, it's gonna have these little nipples. <laughs> so we're gonna have nipple macarons. My cousin Eva told me, sometimes you can flatten out the little nipples by wetting your finger yeah, and pushing them down. <laughs> There we go. Man, these circles really help. So when I've made these in the past, I've been really lazy and I did not use the templates. I just freeformed it. And so my little circle, my shells were like all different shapes and sizes and I had to match them up. So this is my first time actually using a template and I highly recommend it. I've been doing it wrong the whole time. Look at that. All right. Doo, doo, doo. Check it out. This is so satisfying to watch. And like piping is something that you just get better at with time and experience. Like, you see me, I'm doing this little like swishy, okay, not that one, but I'm doing like a little swishy swirly method. And like, that's just something that you just do when you've done it a lot and you have experience. Michelle says, ooh la la, so French nipple macarons. <laughs> French nipple macarons. 
See, but oh look, okay, so the first ones that I piped, so see how they've kind of flattened on their own? So I don't even have to push down the little nipples. They do their own thing. <laughs> Right, look at that. Hey, I'm really proud of these. I hope these turn out. I'm real excited. Look at that. So I have like a 20% success rate with macarons. And I had made them other times and I failed until I tried the Swiss meringue method, which is why I'm so excited to share it with you. Because if you're like me and you love these cookies, but you don't want to, ooh. What is that? Yep, okay. And you are scared to make them, this is a good way to try it. Or if you don't want to pay $4 a cookie. All right, well look at that. I have just enough batter for one tray. I don't have enough for my parchment paper tray. And that is okay by me. Okay, cool. Look at that, so exciting. Okay, so see, these are the first ones I piped. And so see how they've kind of flattened on their own compared to these, like these still have the little nipple thing, but it gives me confidence to know that they're on the right track. I got the right consistency. And if you wanna, what we're gonna need to do is bang the air bubbles out of them. Because if there's any air bubbles, inside while they bake, um, they're gonna kind of show up and you're gonna get hollow macaron shells. So I'm gonna bang them on the counter a couple times to knock out any air bubbles. Okay, bang with purpose. There, yeah, see, so like a little air bubble, some little air bubbles popped out, not a whole lot. Um, you can also use like a toothpick if you see them to kind of poke them out, like this one. Here, I'm gonna use my little chopstick. Here we go. Okay, so when you're regular, when you're making your macarons using a French or Italian style, this would be the step in which you need to air dry them for, recipes say 30 to 40 minutes. I would do, when I did them the other way, I would say hour even, hour and a half. Um, the reason why is when you dry them, it forms a little skin on top of the macaron cookies. And you need the skin to form so that when they bake, they will rise and get the little feet instead of popping up through the top and making a fissure or a crack in your cookie. With the Swiss meringue method, supposedly you do not need to do the drying time. You can just take this and put it right into the oven. If you are nervous and you want to ensure your macaron success, here is my tip for how you can speed up your dry time if you just don't have time to wait. Okay, are you ready for my secret weapon here? A hair dryer. So, I'm not going to do it this time because I wanna see if it'll work, but typically what I would normally do is put my hair dryer on warm and on low and just hair dry the tops of them to get them nice and dry and make sure that they form the skin as nice as I want it. And so this is the step where humidity matters because if it's too humid, the skin isn't gonna form. But Mr. Baking with Chickens read somewhere on the internet that humidity doesn't actually matter and humidity is a myth and we argue about this constantly. So I disagree with him since I'm the one baking and making things. However- Cook's, Cook's Kitchen, <clears throat> Cook's Illust Illustrated. Cook's Illustrated? Mm -hmm. All right, well, they're much better at lots of things than I am, so who knows? All I know is that I want to make sure that my macarons turn out properly. See, look, and all these little air bubbles are still in here. I'm gonna bang them a couple more times. All right, so because this is the Swiss, mer Swiss meringue method and I promise that there is no drying time, I'm gonna pop these into the oven and we're gonna find out if it works, okay? So into the oven they go. 300 degrees for anywhere between like 10 to 13 minutes. Um, I would rather do a slight 
overbake than an underbake because if it's underbaked, they're gonna be sticky in the middle and then when you try to lift them off of the pan, they'll stick and they'll ruin the whole thing. But if you overbake too much, your cookies are gonna be too hard. You could still save an overbaked macaron by painting a little bit of milk after they've baked to help like soften it, but we're gonna see what happens, okay? All right, into the oven. Middle rack and here, I'm gonna put 12 minutes to be safe. All right, so, oh, where we go? Moment of truth, these are baking in the oven, and while these are baking, I think now would be a really excellent time for a word from our egg benefactors, the chickens. Hello, my chickens. Hi, chickens. Where's my chickens? Here, who wants snacks? I have snacks for you. Here you go. I'm gonna pick you. Haha, <laughs> I got snozberry. <laughs> so this is my chicken snozberry, and I'm gonna talk about the secret life of chickens. What do they do all day? And what happens in their teeny, tiny, itty bitty little brains? So as you can see, they have tiny little heads. Their brains are like the size of a pea, and while they're not particularly smart, they're not actually that dumb either. But you know, a day in the life of a chicken is they wake up, they kind of hang out, they preen themselves. So preening means they kind of like take their beaks and clean their feathers, and then they'll go down, eat some breakfast, and then hang out, and then they come outside and they spend the majority of their day just scratching around looking for food to eat, because that's all they do. So imagine the life of a chicken, all you do is eat all day. So they eat the food that we give them and then they also just scratch around in the dirt looking for a little tasty treats, snacks or bugs or little rocks to eat. The little rocks are part of their gizzard that help them digest. It takes about four pounds of food for a chicken to lay a dozen eggs. And then a chicken can drink about one pint of water a day, sometimes even a quart if it's really hot. Hi, little sweetheart. But yeah, that's pretty much what they do. Mo like 80% of their time is spent eating and then they'll also nap in the sun. They'll do dirt baths. That's how chickens keep themselves clean. They roll around in the dirt and they like kick dirt up and underneath their feathers here so that it will clean their feathers and also like kill any bugs that come in underneath. Yeah, yeah, you're very cute. I know. And then chickens instinctively know where to go when they need to go lay eggs. And you're trying to think like, how do they know? Well, they just do. Like this is their nesting box and we kind of make a private little space for them that has something soft for them to go into. And then that's it. They just go in and they lay their eggs. And for whatever reason, there's three nesting boxes, but the chickens all like to lay their eggs in the same box and they'll wait their turn. So one chicken's laying and then another one will wait until one's done and then they kind of go in. They tend to lay their eggs in the morning or in the first half of the day. But typically like a chicken that's laying regularly lays about one egg a day. So right now I'm getting five eggs a day from the chickens that lay eggs. Two of them decided to not lay, but that's just because they're older and that's what they do. So yeah, if you have any questions, I'm gonna head back down into the house to check on those macarons to make sure that they don't burn. But if you've got any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll answer anything you wanna know about the secret life of chickens and what they do all day. Huh. Okay. In the meantime, ah. watch them put themselves to bed. Oh yeah, and while I head back down, you can watch them put themselves to bed. All right, let me get the eggs and see you back down in the kitchen. All right, chickens. See you later. Was that fun? <laughs> a word from our chicken sponsors. So chickens are magical little creatures, aren't they? Like they know when to put themselves to bed and they just instinctually kind of know what to do. They know to lay their eggs in a nesting box. Occasionally you'll get a rogue chicken who will have a hidden nest because they want to hide it from you. But for the most part, they just sort of know what to do and they're little sweet creatures. So any questions or comments here about 
the chickens. I think now is a really great time. Um, while these are still baking, we've got about eight minutes left on the oven, and I'm gonna make some cream cheese frosting. Ah, yes, we've got some stuff to catch up on. <clears throat> the nipples are disappearing, so I guess we won't see the processes of rubbing them with wetted fingers. So this is how you, you stick your finger in your mouth and you lick it and then you just go, no, and then you go like it. No, just kidding. You get a bowl of water, you dip your finger in, and then you just kind of like pat it down a bit. Like not too wet, like just, just a little. <laughs> oh. Um, Eva has an interesting idea. Oh. She says a ceiling fan works. Ah, that's a good one. Yep, yep. Um, oh, Travis, that's hilarious. Love the use of split screen. <laughs> Have you been watching a lot of Brian DePaul movies lately? So Travis has an awesome, is it a podcast? Yeah. Right? A podcast about movies. Like, he's super into, like, indie movies, and him and his friends just go and talk about movies. Travis, drop a note in the comments. Tell us what the name of your podcast is, and if you are a movie nerd like Travis, please give him a listen. Okay, so I'm making cream cheese frosting here, and I know I'm just dumping stuff in without telling you what's going on. So I added in two tablespoons of unsalted room temp butter, and two ounces of cream cheese. I'm making a cream cheese frosting, and then I have 100 grams of powdered sugar. So I should, I decided to make this in a bowl with a little hand whisk instead of in the KitchenAid, and this might have been a mistake, but it could be funny because we're gonna end up with powdered sugar everywhere. We'll see what happens. Okay, and then a tablespoon of milk. So I'm using a uh, soy milk, because that's what I have, but you could use whole milk, oat milk, whatever milk you desire. Makes sense, okay. Little tablespoon. Let's hope we don't make a mess. <laughs> okay, I'm definitely making a mess, so here's my tip. <laughs> I should have used a bigger bowl, but I didn't, because I'm lazy. All right, so I'm gonna take this, put it on top, so that it doesn't puff out all over the place. Ah! <laughs> I just inhaled powdered sugar. Mm. Mm, okay. This is a deeper bowl. You know what I'm gonna do? Hey, Mr. Baking with Chickens? Yeah, you want a deeper bowl? No, can you get me the metal one? It's over there. Yeah, oh, the metal, metal mixing bowl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this was a very poor decision on my part, but I hope that you enjoyed that. Bigger bowl. <laughs> oh, Michelle asked, how long ah. do chickens live? Oh, how long do chickens live? So chickens live until, I mean, eight to 10? or even older, like some people have like 15, 20 year old chickens, uh, but they only lay eggs, like their peak laying age is like up to about four years old. Like they'll still lay when they're older, just not as much and not as often. Like you'll get an egg every once in a while and they could end up with like, you know, problem, old lady egg problems as they get older. But if you're gonna get a chicken and you want them for eggs, just know that you're getting a chicken and you're gonna have to figure out what to do for it for the entirety of its life. Um, it's only really gonna lay most of its eggs for you until it's about four. Like Olga Berry's four and a half, five years old, and she's just completely stopped laying eggs. She doesn't provide anything and she's just a delightful little pet these days. Um, but we've decided to keep them as pets. But when I first got chickens, I was pretty adamant about it. I feel like, do you remember this? I was saying, I'm like, no, you know what? I don't really have a problem with turning them into chicken soup. Like, I'm all right with that. Cause we have a friend who keeps egg chickens and meat chickens and I've helped him process them before and I'm okay with it. Um, I feel like if, you know, I'm gonna eat meat, I should know what that experience is like. So I've definitely processed chickens for meat eating and it's just part of it. But for our chickens, I feel pretty confident that, oh, I need um, the paddle. 
sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. But yeah, so we're keeping ours as pets. Um, if you can do it, you could turn them into soup, but we figured they have earned their keep and they deserve to live comfortably for the, in their retirement. All right, Let's try this again. All right, wasn't that easy? So much easier. All right, there's a few lumps. I'm gonna do it a couple more times. There we go. Look at that beautiful cream cheese frosting. So that was a good lesson in if you've got a KitchenAid, just use the KitchenAid. Don't try to use other things. Um, and if that wasn't a commercial and a strong endorsement for getting a stand mixer of your own, I don't know what is. So this is a KitchenAid. Obviously they are the king, queen, whatever, granddaddy of the KitchenAid stand mixers that everybody has. This is a professional model that you has the lever that you can lift up, but most of like the home sized ones are the tilt lift. There's also Smeg also makes a cool one. That's really cool. If you don't know, Smeg makes those cool like retro fridges. They have a cool stand mixer. And I'm sure there's other brands too, but KitchenAid is just really the way to go here. Mm. Mm. Ah, Travis. Cinephiles Digest is the podcast. Thank you. Cinephiles Digest. And where can we find you, Travis? Spotify? Apple? Probably both. Google it. It'll show up. Okay. All right. So this is a cream cheese frosting. I'm going to stick with white. I was thinking about coloring it pink, but because my macarons turned out to be a weird baby Yoda barf color, <laughs> I think, I don't know, what do you think guys? Oh, look, they're done. Okay, what do you think? While I'm checking on those, should I keep this white or should I color it pink? So this is the color we've got. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's not really Baby Yoda green. It's kind of like, a, I don't even know. It's not really a robin's egg. It's not quite teal. It's like teal mixed with brown. So it's like an earthy teal. It's a Yoda teal. It's a Yoda. <laughs> Should I make it, okay, so should I make the cream cheese frosting pink or should I leave it white? Tell me. Oh, I'm thinking Boba Fett pink. Oh, Boba Fett. <laughs> okay. Oh, Janet Let's check. said, anxiously awaiting <laughs> the electric whisk. Uh oh. So, <laughs> all right, you want to take a peek in here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to flip it. I'm going to bake it for a few more. <laughs> you guys, these turned out so terrible. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to bake them for a few more seconds, but see how wrinkly they are? All right, so that was a result of not drying, you guys. Ah! All right, so the Swiss macro method says that you should be able to do this without drying. <coughs> but as you can see, by some of the wrinkly macarons, they're so ugly. Um, that is not the case. So next time, I would say, you know, you probably don't need to dry it as long. Also, it's humid here today. It's like 57, it's a little more than I'm comfortable with. Um, and if you have those two factors going on for you, I think taking the time to dry it, like maybe 30 minutes or at least doing a fan or a hair dryer would have made all the difference for this. Um, but because I promised that it was a no dry recipe. <laughs> so that's what it looks like. But you know what's actually really cool? So the way these turned out are actually what the original macarons that Italian 
pastry chefs made in Italy, like for Queen Catherine Medici. If you remember my nerdy history fact, go back. Um, if you want to rewatch it, it's probably down in the description below. If you're, when you rewatch it, I'll put a timestamp on it. But in my nerdy food fact, in the history of macarons, the original macarons made by Venetian monasteries and Italian pastry chefs didn't have the fillings, if you recall. They were still just the cookies and they were cracked and wrinkly and they just ate them just like that. And it wasn't until the 1930s that La Durée and these other pastry chefs started making them the way that we see now with the fillings. So technically what I've made is an original macaron. Original macaron, okay. <laughs> oh man, all right. So I'm either a genius or terrible at this. <laughs> Look at that. Ma, ma. Ma, ma, ma. So we've got some votes hmm. Hmm. for hmm. pink. And oh, interesting <laughs> idea. Michelle says add cocoa nibs then it will be speckled like robin egg. You know, I was going to do a speckled robin egg and then I totally forgot because, you know, we're live here. Um, I actually had all the food coloring. To make a speckled robin egg, what you need is brown gel food coloring and vodka. Mix it together and then you get a paintbrush and you splatter it. You could also do cocoa nibs, but it wouldn't like it's Cocoa nibs would be like thick and not flat. Okay, so let's examine these very, very unfortunate macarons that did not turn out at all in any way whatsoever. So my foolproof Swiss meringue macaron method just so failed me and this is incredibly embarrassing. But, okay, let's take a look at it. Um, and Eva, if you're on here, you can add in your comments too, since you actually are very good at this. So see how they're flat and they did not in any way lift. So macarons, when they bake, are supposed to lift, like, right? Like, so when they bake, they go, whoop, and they get the little feet around it. So like, there's no feet and there is no lift happening here. <laughs> These are flat, wrinkly Frisbees. <laughs> Oh, you know what we can do though? Um, so how, what do you do with failed macarons? Okay, that's the question. So you can take them and just fill them and eat them, which is what I am going to do. Or you can take the shells, and I saw somebody on Instagram did this and I thought it was so cool. So you take the shells and you fold it into like a cake batter and then you basically do like, it looks like a terrazzo, macaron like cake, if that makes sense. So like I would do a white cake batter, take these crushed macarons and then fold them into the cake batter before baking. And then so when they bake, you're gonna end up with a, like you're gonna end up with like the teal, like sugary macaron shells in the center, which I mean, look, they're still delicious. I, it's totally gonna eat them, it doesn't really matter. But these are an incorrect <laughs> macaron. I'm so sad, I really wanted them to work. But you know what, that's part of making macarons. It doesn't really matter how many times you make them, like, you'll still, and like, they can still fail. Which is why I don't understand why whenever you watch these competition shows, everybody's making all these macarons, because they're so risky. Like, this could totally happen. I don't understand. Ah, Cat Apocalypse says, there we go. <laughs> It's just vintage style. <laughs> yeah, see these are, I'm making them to the original um, Italians. Oh boy. Retro macarons. Oh boy, you guys. Do you want to crack oh. one open to see the they're, inside? Well, they're, they're, they're still sticky. They're stuck to the pan. I'm going to put them back into the oven. <laughs> well, oh you guys. So sad. This is, you know what though? I like fails because we can talk about it and then you can see what something looks like when it goes wrong. Because oftentimes, like if you're watching these YouTube videos, you're looking at Instagram and everything looks perfect and everything works the first time. And that's just not true. Like it's, 
you make things and they fail all the time, right? Like I've made certain recipes a million times and like it still messes up and then it's an opportunity to learn. Okay, like why did that happen? Why are these wrinkly? Why didn't they lift? Um, I definitely think humidity and temperature has something to do with it. It's pretty warm in the kitchen right now and the humid, it's also kind of like on and off rainy. So it was a bit risky to do. Eh. Um, and you know what, that's just the reality of baking and we can't let it get us down when things don't go our way, right? Okay, they failed, they suck, they're vintage, retro, whatever. Um, but, all right, how do we salvage it? What do we do with it? Like if you're a business owner and you've got macarons and they failed, like you don't just wanna throw that batch away, like that's money. So how do you change that into something different or something new that you could serve that people might like? So if you have any other ideas of what you would do with these wrinkly, not so great macaron shells, let us know. Chelsea has a great term. Hmm. They're rustic. They're rustic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bespoke. Bes I, mean, I hate that word. That's a terrible word. I know. I, know. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate, 100% accurate though. Oh, where am I? Oh, here we go. That's what I was doing with this. Okay, oh, what was the consensus for pink or white? It looks like everybody was on the pink train. Oh, we're on the pink train, okay, okay. We'll do the pink train. We'll just make an ugly macaron look even funnier. Uh, I think I've only, ever, I've made three batches of macarons that have turned out properly. but I have eaten many, many more. Eey. Okay, so I've got some of this rose gel colored icingy stuff, food coloring, and I'm gonna mix it all in. I'm using chopsticks because I can wash them and they don't stain. Like everything stains all the time with these food, like my hands are gonna be stained, like this poor KitchenAid is gonna be stained for a very long time. All right, ooh, look at that, that's pretty. Let's do a soft pink, soft pink, more pink, more pink. This is already ridiculous, we should just keep going. More pink. Hey, what's everybody doing for St. Patrick's Day? Did you, oh, by the way, did you know that today is National Pie Day? Pie P-I 3.14. 3.141591 something something. <laughs> hey, I got a nerdy math fact. Dustin, that's your cue. Nerdy math fact. Nerdy math fact. Nerdy, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh. You know what to do. <laughs> All right, nerdy math fact, so check it out. Okay, so pi is 3.1415 something something whatever whatever, and it is a mathematical constant. And we use pi to calculate the circumference and area of a circle. Um, you can take, right, let's go back, okay, math, brain hurting. Um, you do multiply pi by the diameter of the cake and you get its circumference. And no matter what size the circle is, big, small, anything, 3.14 still applies. And that's how you find the circumference. And if you wanna find the area, please forgive me, COVID brain, I can't remember the formula. Is it pi r squared to find the? The, the area of a Area of a circle? circle? Is, it, <laughs> is it pi r squared? I feel like somebody would know here, um, but yeah. And it's also, what, whatever the number is called, it's on my Instagram post from today, I'm blanking, but um, it is a series of numbers that are, in, it's an infinite something. <sighs> Meaning the numbers don't repeat in any pattern. And then like some like smart people with some super smart computers calculated, I think like a thousand up, like a version of like the numbers of pi to like a thousand numbers. Ah, here's some catching up on some ideas what to do with them. Uh, Chelsea says, add them as a layer in a trifle. Trifle, I like that, ooh.
I like it. And then Dan says, crumble them up on a donut. Michelle, okay. you could break them up and use them to decorate the outside of a cake. It would look like oh, a that'd be cool. design. That's cool. That's you guys are so cool. creative. Here's my thing. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Ah. Eva, pie times radius squared. Pi r squared. Exactly. Look at that. Pi r squared. Do they need to cool? They do need to cool. I mean, like, I wouldn't normally do this, but these are so messed up anyways, I'm just gonna do it. Because what am I gonna do? Break them more? And you know, I also like this because this is also where the opportunity to be creative comes in, right? Like, when you're not afraid to fail anymore and you've let go of perfection, you can just kind of do whatever and mess around and have fun. And some of my best ideas come when we're just kind of playing around. What do we got here? Oh man, yeah, this is. Here we go. All right, I mean, they need to cool for a little bit. So now's a good time for comments, questions, chit chat, chicken questions. Um, if you're bored and you're tuning out because these failed and these did not work out. Thank you, sorry, so bad. How long did they take to cool? I usually let them cool for a significant amount of time. I don't know how these are gonna do because like they kind of look smudgy in the center. Like they look like they were too wet. Not a factor of drying? I don't know, it could be. These are straight, I'm not gonna know until I break into it. Like I baked it for way longer than it should have. So technically they should be fine, but I don't know. I mean, also you have to let them dry so that like it'll kind of crystallize, right? Cause this entire cookie is egg whites suspended with sugar glue and flour. So as it cools, the crystalline structure of the sugar and the egg white proteins are gonna bond and harden, but we gotta let that happen. Hey, let's check in on the chicken cam. What are they up to? Oh, that's a good Cause you know, I know that watching yeah. macarons cool is really exciting, almost exciting as paint dry, but maybe the chickens have something more exciting going on. Well, Let's see, because somebody would have to be in the nesting box. Snozberry was kind of broody, so she could be in there. So a broody chicken means that they want to be a mom and they don't want to leave the nest and they want to sit on their eggs. So this is spring and spring is kind of the time for broody season. Um, and they just kind of like, it's an instinctual thing. Like certain chickens and certain breeds are more broody than others and have a tendency to want to sit on their eggs to hatch them. Like some are just like, nah, I'm not interested in being a mother. They lay their eggs and they leave and they walk away. And then others just want to hatch all the eggs. Um, so Snozberry was broody yesterday and I went in to go reach my hand in to get her eggs and she screamed at me. He. She got all like puffy, like a little like dinosaur. And she went like, Gah! <laughs> So those eggs belong to Pickleberry, Burrito Berry, and Snozberry. And they all like to lay their eggs in the same nest box. So Pickleberry, the brown egg, lays hers first at approximately six something AM. And then Snozberry comes in right after her and then Burrito Berry muscles out Snozberry and then lays her egg. And how do I know this? Because I'm a chicken voyeur. 
we put this camera in there in their nest box so like we spend a stupid amount of time just staring at the chickens and watching what they do it's kind of weird <laughs> do you guys want to see a chicken lay an egg is that something you guys would be into because like you can kind of see it here but like we'd have to change the camera angle if you want to see it like coming out of their butt <laughs> yeah i'm thinking plexiglass Perhaps. All right. All right. So I'm kind of trying to peel these off. This, these are terrible. This is, you guys, I have failed a lot of macarons. I don't think I've ever failed this terribly before. Like this batch takes the award for the worst macarons I have ever made. And okay, so I'm looking at the inside and they're just like, they're really gummy. It's like really gummy and really chewy. So I definitely think the humidity had a lot to do with it because they shouldn't be like this. They should at least be more crisp. And that did not happen. I mean, yeah, so like, like they're not really crunchy. They're like mushy and chewy. Still good, like, it's like chewy, like a good chewy brownie is chewy. Show. Yeah, see, so like, see how gummy they are on the bottom? So this was a doomed project, but I'm all right with that. If you're all right with it. Mm. Should we even frost them? Or should I try again to make a better batch? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I'm not going to make you watch me make another batch, but. Oh, Emily mm -hmm. asks, can you use your hair dryer on cool setting to cool them? Uh, maybe, but I don't think that that's going to help too much. I mean, yes, but these are doomed to begin with. Emily, are you baking along? <laughs> Oh. Have you made them? <laughs> and Michelle asks, how do you come up with flavor combinations for macarons? Mmm. I don't know, whatever sounds good. Ooh, you want to see my secret to flavor, guys? Hang on. Hold, please. Do, 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 do. This. If you really like to cook and you like to play with flavor combinations, but you don't know like what goes well with what, this book, The Flavor Bible, is awesome. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. So Michelle asked, you know, how do you decide what flavors go with what? So the cool thing with The Flavor Bible is you open it and there's basically an encyclopedia of every single, almost every ingredient that like you can generally come up with. And it tells you what they are. So like, um, here, we'll go to Earl Grey. Where is Earl Grey? And, um, yep, here it is, Earl, Earl. My friend got this for me a long time ago and I never really used it until now and it's become one of my favorite tools. Michelle has a secondary question as well. Okay. All right, well, Earl Grey is not in this book, so I'm gonna go with a different one. Um, let's see. Here's a sneaky question uh -huh. from Michelle. Uh -huh. How do you infuse macaron? Oh, okay, I'll get to that one. All right, okay, so we don't have Earl Grey in here. So it doesn't have everything, it has a lot of stuff, but it's just, this is an old version of the book. Okay, so here's limes. So it will tell you what season limes are here. So it'll say year round. What is the taste? It will say sour. So, you know, other things like, um, you know, here I've got lettuce, romaine lettuce. It tastes sweet and bitter, weight, light, volume, quiet. So it kind of gives you a profile of what it tastes like. And then it tells you all of the different things that lime pairs well with. So limes pair really well with apricots, avocado, strawberries, like any kind of berry, caramel, chili peppers, jalapeno or serrano, um, coconut, coconut milk, cilantro, 
cream cheese, creme fraiche, dates, duck, figs, fish, ginger. So this is how I do a lot of my like flavor matching. I'll be like, hmm, I have an idea. I want to do something. What, and you know, I want to incorporate a savory herb. What goes well with it? So this is good for cooking, like chicken, fish. Like I use this for cooking too. So um, check it out. It's called the Flavor Bible, the essential guide to culinary creativity based on the wisdom of America's most imaginative chefs by Karen Page and Andrew Dornenberg. Where is it? Okay. So, are you saying, does that have anything to do with Flavortown? You can go to Flavortown. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Michelle's other question was, how would you infuse a macaron? Okay, so um, as you, if some of you know, I am into cannabis and I enjoy cooking with it and baking with it very much. And Michelle and I do a weekly Weed Wednesday group where we hang out and just chit chat with a bunch of friends and catch up and get to try different cannabis products. Um, so how would I infuse a macaron? Two ways. You could try doing a cannabis sugar. I haven't tried that yet, but the Shogi's cannabis sugar that I've tried doesn't melt very well. Um, I haven't experimented with, a, with it a lot yet, so I don't know how that would work with the macaron. But it's, I would do it, honestly, I would do it in the buttercream or in the filling. Like I would either make a, use can of butter and make an infused buttercream and put that in the middle or, and or um, infused jam, used a cannabis infused honey to make a jam, and then you could do jam and buttercream as your filling. That's how I would do it. All right, these are a lost cause. Look, I can't even peel this off of here because they're stuck and they're so sticky. Like, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> you guys. Eva has a little uh, bit of info too. Mm, thank you. She says, you normally dry the macaron shells to create a skin that forces the cracks to happen only at the bottom and creating the feet. The fact that the cracks are on top means air was escaping from the top. Hmm. So the drying time was important is what you're saying. And by skipping it, I have caused this macaron monstrosity that is happening in front of me. <laughs> All right, so this is sad, and I'm, I'm gonna stop trying now. I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna pipe one and eat it. Oh, Heidi asks, does this have anything to do with the egg whites cooking at the beginning? Oh, interesting. Um, I don't think so, because they were all right for the most part. It could be, it could be because I overheated my egg whites and like something sciency happened and like the sugar got all weird. Also possible. Catapocalypse says, nest box drama is <laughs> fun. <laughs> I actually spend a lot of time helping with a 24 seven chicken stream on Twitch. What? So big time chicken boy area here. Wait, there's a chicken stream on Twitch? Tell us more about this chicken stream on Twitch. What do you do? Okay, there we go. <laughs> hey, these look actually kind of cute with the pink. Look at guys. Can you see it? Where is it? Here. 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 It's kind of cute. I mean, they're ugly macarons, but the color themselves. All right, I'm gonna have to try this again to redeem myself because this is just embarrassing. But hopefully you learned something fun today. I really enjoyed learning about the history of macarons and how they came were introduced by Catherine Medici. I think that was the coolest part out of all of this research, um, except for the eating part, which I am going to do anyways, because, hmm, still really good. Oh, so if you make your macarons and they do turn out and don't look like a hot mess like this, macarons are best enjoyed after you let them sit overnight. So you make the cookies, they should be hard and they're not gumming. You put in your buttercream frosting, sandwich them and then store them in a sealed container 
in the fridge and keep them cold. And they're actually better the next day after the buttercream has had a chance to kind of like soak into the cookie and soften it to make it chewy a little bit. So that's my tip. If yours don't fail and they turn out, um, store them in the fridge, best overnight. But I'm gonna eat these anyways. I'm gonna find a way to do this and maybe I will try this again to redeem myself. But any other questions before we do our sign off because it has been a very long time and you guys are awesome for hanging in for so long. Well, let's catch up here. Ba -ba ah. Thank you, Michelle. She says, we learn from mistakes. Yes. Thank you for mm. sharing the flavor Bible book. Lots of people. Ah, they're dragon scale cookies, Michelle said. <laughs> That's really cute. I like that. Yeah. If we... You know what? If I could peel them off, I could make a cake and like layer them like little dragon scales. Oh, that's a good idea. Wait till the next Game of Thrones comes around. That's fun. Right? Mmm. All right. So my mouth is full. My hands are blue. You want to break one of those in half? Sure. Show the camera to just see what I mean this... like... Okay. So here's... Here's the gooey sadness that's happening here, you guys. Mm. Incorrect, but yummy all the same. Filled with food coloring. Mm. Oh, you can also use natural food colorings. If you have like um, color powders, like, um, like dried pow pitaya, whatever, free shred fruits, those are also really good for natural food coloring if you don't want to use gel, so. All right. Any of the, break one of those sandwiches open. Oh, this is. That's, I mean, I should let it sit so that the buttercream oh. hardens. Yeah, there's really not, I mean, I could, but it's just gonna squish out. Here, you should just eat it. I'm gonna hand it to Mr. Baking with Chickens. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for hanging with me on this very lovely, beautiful Pie Day Sunday. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And, ooh, next week I am going to be making magic blondie bars for Easter. And they are going to be actually a special collab that I'm doing with my friend Kirsten of the very best cookie in the whole wide world. And we're actually going to sell these and you will be able to order them and buy them and you can pick them up, at, pick them up or get them shipped or delivered anywhere in the US. So in LA, you can pick them up or pick them up, pick them up or have it delivered. Um, if you live anywhere in the US, you can order them online and you can get them shipped to you. So next week, next Sunday, same time, same place. Um, they definitely aren't gonna fail because I know how to make those and they aren't bitchy little cookies like these. Um, Magic Blondie Bars, thank you so much and... And Friday nights are coming. Oh yeah, and then we're gonna try this new idea for Friday nights baked with chickens where I get high as F and bake yummy delicious things that come up in my crazy high brain. So last yeah, time I did infused. this, last time, and we're gonna talk about infused cooking. So if you're interested in cannabis baking and um, I won't actually be doing, well, mm, we'll talk about it, oregano. And um, I'm gonna, if you wanna learn about how to bake with cannabis, um, educational only, we can talk about all the different ways to infuse. We'll play with my Levo machine here that I got that we need to play more with. So that's gonna be baked with chickens and we're thinking, yep, yeah, this is the Levo infuser that we're gonna play with. Um, so if you would like to do that, we're thinking maybe Friday nights at 10 p.m., like a late night. So grab your fave something something and join me for a baked with chicken. So hopefully we'll do that this week. Um, stay tuned, TBD, we'll let you know. But next week, Sunday, definitely Easter Magic Blondie Bars and then we will try a baked with chickens. All right, everybody, my lovelies, thank you so much for tolerating me in this mess of insanity. So have a good weekend. Buck, buck, bake, everyone.